Everything you do inside the gym makes everything you do outside the gym better. Skeletal muscle is really what is going to maintain you in times of fasting. It's going to maintain you in times of injury, illness, cancer. The only way that your brain knows that your body is being used is if you're increasing the load on your skeleton. We have something written in the gym that says, everything you do inside the gym makes everything you do outside the gym better. And I see that every day in my own life and in other people's lives. So the take home from that is obviously whatever your physical tasks are in life will be easier because you're training above and beyond that, right? Whatever you're carrying, lifting, pushing, pulling, hinging, lunging, whatever in the gym, whatever you have to do in real life, easy because you've already done it and you've done it heavier. It improves your patience. It improves your quality of sleep. You're a better spouse. You're a better parent. You're a better friend. You're more resistant to injury. You're more resistant to disease, or illness. You, your rate of absenteeism goes down at work. You become a better employee or a better boss. You earn more. That's rewarded. That reward, whether it's financial or whatever, people look at you and go, wow, this guy's you know always healthy, always upbeat. Your moods are better, improved moods. And this is all science. I'm not telling you anything like people go, I don't really feel that way. Yeah, you know, science, scientifically, you do. Those are, those are all things that happen at a physiological level. Um, and then your self-confidence goes up because of all those other things that have happened because of what you did in the gym. And then that just, to me, opens up so many other doors how can you not want to work out and i'm not saying work out with me or work out the way i work out i'm saying do something physical you have a brain and a body you're arguably working your brain every single day work your body every day there's a quote that you share with me you said that if it's not sustainable it's not successful yep let's talk a little bit about that i think that applies to everything from your training to your nutrition to your sleep patterns to your workload to your romantic relationship, to your friendships. It just, it has to be something, however you structure it and set it up consciously or unconsciously from the beginning, if you can't maintain that, it's not gonna be as good as it could be. Mm. You'll be able to get something out of it for sure. But you have to set it up in a way that, that you can repeat it because it's through the repetition that you get the benefits. Very few things you could do one off. I mean, maybe you bungee jump one off and you go, wow, I don't need to do that again. But very few things you do one time and get any real benefit from. It comes down to uh, performance aesthetics and feel, right? And, and you can shuffle that order any way you want. For the athletes, and I, I see this having worked with a number of them over a, a number of years, it's maybe the only demographic across the board that puts performance first ultimately more people should probably consider performance because you're going to need to perform and by perform i just mean move and do whatever your daily life requires whether it's uh, you know lifting the sack of dog food out of the back of the car or whatever your thing is um you have to be able to perform looks we're in a we're a very visual society i mean driving over here i saw i saw billboards i saw things on the side of buses i saw people in t-shirts all on some level highlighting the body beautiful whatever that is from that marketer or that advertiser or, or that person wearing that shirt standpoint right that's so so we can't say oh i don't care what i look like i just no we all care on some level that's why we have mirrors right you do you looked in that mirror everybody in here looked in that mirror today some maybe for a lot longer than others but you do care about that and that's not just this we do care we may not do anything about it but ultimately we all want to look good we all want to present our best self for whatever reason and that's a whole nother book um and the other one is for feel not tying I look good to I feel good, but tying the exercise made my body healthy. And when it's healthy and I do certain movements, I feel better by the end of my day, in the middle of my day, when normally I didn't feel as good as I could have. The gym is probably the most fair place in the world to me, mm -hmm. meaning 
whatever you put back, whatever you put in, it's equitable in terms of what you get back. And I've seen people go in and they give 40% and they want 100 back. And I'm like, you're going to get 40 back. And when you leave, if you start f***ing around with your diet or your sleep or your recovery protocols or your stress levels, that f that's going to come out of that 40. Mm -hmm. So you have to, to me, you go in and you give 100, which doesn't mean every workout you know is looks like a rocky montage but it means every workout you got to give 100 percent of whatever you have that day and we don't all come in at 100 percent every day that goes from pro athletes to to academy award winners you just don't so you have to give 100 percent of whatever your 100 is that day and you will get that back every single time muscle is the amino acid reservoir every time you are not eating your tissues your brain your liver your kidneys all require amino acids, a steady state of amino acids in a fasted state. The place you're going to get that, skeletal muscle. The body is constantly going over a process of turnover. It's not, you know, you don't stimulate muscle and that tissue stops being active. This is a constant process. Skeletal muscle is really what is going to maintain you in times of fasting. It's going to maintain you in times of injury, illness, we know at cancer, we know that survivability of cancer is increased with the amount of skeletal muscle you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are really big factors and we're totally avoiding the fact that skeletal muscle is the primary organ system of protection. So this is, this is looking at what's happening internally. What about externally? <laughs> yeah. You know, like if I think about it, when, you know, that when there was a time, I'm conjuring up images of, you know, swords and shields and these kind of yeah. things. And so when you said body armor, that really jumped out as like literally kind of like a protective mechanism. Yeah. Like why am I able to, to grow these pecs <laughs> to might maybe protect my heart or yeah. something like that? Well, I think that the concept of skeletal muscle is really all encompassing. We can never say, I mean, listen, take out the bodybuilding community, which perhaps is uh, a bit at that cusp end of intensity in terms of skeletal muscle, but the body was designed for movement. And right now we have an opportunity to not move, but we're a human machine. The human machine was designed for hard physical labor. Does that protect us? It definitely protects us in a multitude of ways, balance, strength, flexibility, survivability. If you go back to the times of swords, I'm sure the guy that had the most well-conditioned muscle was the individual that was going to survive. I mean, I, of course, wasn't, these, this is just my perspective. I wasn't around during that time. But when we think about survivability, skeletal muscle, while not easy to put on, requires time and attention and dietary changes, right? You can't eat the way you did in your youth when you are primed for anabolic growth that does transition, which we will definitely talk about. And that goes to the point of why protein restriction is so dangerous for an aging population. Because as we age, as we think about protecting our body, our body armor, that amino acid reservoir, and there's so many things that we're gonna talk about as it relates to skeletal muscle. Number one, the fact that it allows us to uh, aid in protein turnover, which is ongoing. But also skeletal muscle, there, there's so many things. Skeletal muscle is one of the primary sites of insulin resistance. And we cannot go one day without hearing about insulin resistance. Yeah, it's epidemic, absolutely epidemic. And we think about it as it relates to obesity. But insulin resistance, there is evidence that insulin resistance begins in healthy 20 year olds that are sedentary, a decade before we're seeing changes in liver abnormalities, a decade before we're seeing changes in triglyceride levels, blood glucose, insulin. Insulin resistance of skeletal muscle is one of the primary defects of, I don't wanna say all, but nearly all the diseases that we're seeing. Heart disease, cancer, obesity. Skeletal muscle needs to be our focus as opposed to looking at the periphery which is adiposity. 
This brings us back to, you mentioned cancer earlier yeah. and being a protective mechanism there. So I was just wondering in my mind, like, what are all the pieces yeah. that could make that possible? I'm sure that, of course, insulin is going to be one of those factors. Well, obesity is a known risk factor for cancer. Right. And cancer is very broad. Cancer is a disease of the genome. There are multiple different kinds of cancer. But the things that we can do something about really relate to getting our body composition in check. Not only that, not just that skeletal muscle is going to protect you with cancer cachexia, which is, you know, cancer can be a very highly catabolic state. And we've seen, you know, individuals who are going through chemo or have cancer, you know, in a clinic, when someone has rapid weight loss, I mean, one of the things that you think is cancer. It is a highly catabolic state, it destroys skeletal muscle, and an individual's survivability is going to be better if they have healthier skeletal muscle. I also want to mention something else, not just that skeletal muscle is protective from the mechanical aspect, from the amino acid reservoir, but exercise. Exercise is, I don't wanna say you know broadly anti-cancer, but it definitely can interface with the immune system and it can definitely help protect against certain kinds of cancers. Exercising skeletal muscle increases natural killer cells. It increases an interface with the immune system and with the inflammation in the body. It counterbalances inflammatory mechanisms in the body. It's so powerful and it's so simple. It's so simple. And you know what we really need to do is how do we bridge the gap between fitness professionals and medical professionals? Right now when we think about skeletal muscle, oftentimes we think about physical fitness. Physical fitness is incredibly important and the way i think that we think about it is a bit simplified because we really need to bring it into an interface of medicine movement is medicine muscle is medicine do we have an obesity crisis yes but what we really have is a muscle crisis if you look at brain function and longevity it's very clear that the body is informing the brain about the status of your entire being, okay? And I, I truly mean that in the non-mystical sense. When we do load-bearing exercise of any kind, it could even be air squats for some people, but if they're doing any kind of resistance training with weights or machines or body weight, there are actually hormones that are secreted from our bones. This is wild, this thing's called like osteonectin is an example of one that are secreted that go to the brain that, that enhance the, survival and the function of neurons, of nerve cells in the brain. And at first, when I heard this, I thought, this is crazy. The bones are making hormones, but it makes perfect sense. The skeleton is a very important system in our body. How does the, how do the areas of the brain that control movement, how do the areas of the brain that control learning, how do they know whether or not you are still moving or not? Well, they could know because your heart is beating, but maybe your heart's beating really fast because you're stressed out about something. The only way that your brain knows that your body is being used and that your brain needs to continue to adapt and to stay strong is if you're increasing the load on your skeleton. And if you look at cognitive decline and loss of memory and things over time, and you look at bodily function and the loss of certain functions, what you find is that there are these weird things that are correlated with brain longevity. And some of them include, for instance, the ability to jump and land, All right? I was talking to my, my mother's in her, uh, I'll, uh, sorry, mom. She's in her, she's in her uh, mid, mid seventies now. And we were, we were talking about this because she said, you know, I want to stay healthy. I want to keep my brain healthy. And I said, well, can you jump up and land? And she said, what are you talking about? That's crazy. And I said, can you jump up and land? I didn't want her to hurt herself. And we were talking about this. A lot of people as they age, get injuries, hip injuries that take them out of commission. The ability to jump, not huge distances, right? Um, but to just to jump and land with, and be stable doing that. Obviously, you don't want people harming themselves. That's correlated with brain longevity and body longevity. What is it? Well, it's it's not just about shuffling around. It's because the bones are taking that that impact. So when we weight train, we we provide load forces onto the bones. The bones send signals to the nervous system and to the brain, and so there's brain longevity. So that's a kind of a it's a roundabout but very mechanistic way of answering your question that indeed when our body is strengthened, our brain gets better at the neuronal health level. Now in terms of resilience, which I think, and, and our capacity to deal with stress, this is an interesting one. 
I think there are several places where exercise carries over to an enhanced ability to deal with stress. First of all, is all the indirect stuff, like it improves our sleep, it reduces inflammation in the body, provided that exercise isn't too intense or too too frequent. So there's all the indirect ways that it supports us and makes our us more capable. But then there are the 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 pain points of exercise, and those come in different forms. One of the less discussed pain points of exercise is the one where you don't want to exercise and you do it anyway. That's making yourself mentally stronger. And here I'm sort of paraphrasing in a, in a much less entertaining way than the great David Goggins, right? His whole, not his whole thing, he's about many things, but a lot of what David's about is about taking yourself from way back on your heels, don't want to get out of bed, don't want to do something, and getting into that forward center of mass. That is a very valuable brain function to be able to take yourself from a place of, I don't want to do it at all. It's the last thing I want to do and I'm going to lean into this. That carries over. And then the other one is the pain that you experience, healthy pain, during the exercise itself. The burning of your lungs, the burning of the lactic acid buildup, the the straining under a rep or something like that. And there your cognitive or your your thoughts about what you're doing. I'm here because I, I chose to be. I might not want to be, but I chose to be. Those are two different things, right? I chose to be here. No one's forcing me to do this. I don't have a gun to my head. I'm doing this and this is going to benefit me. Over time, that will change your relationship to effort. And the holy grail of life, I believe, is when effort feels good. And uh, no one gets to be in that state all the time. But I think that when we push ourselves physically, we get multiple opportunities to learn to go from the, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm I'm kind of, that's my voice in my own head, I don't want to, and then doing it anyway. And then you have to remember to reward yourself. And that reward should not be in the form of an external reward. This is very important. It's tempting to say, I'm gonna reward myself with the meal, I'm gonna, you can still enjoy all the things you enjoy, but the reward has to be one that you give yourself mentally. Because when you start to give yourself external rewards, you're teaching your brain that rewards only come from the outside. When you give yourself internal rewards, and you can even make this a one minute meditation practice at the end of a particularly hard cold shower, or you get out, you just sit there and tell yourself, this is good for me, I chose to do this, this is benefiting me. Those messages actually, I know it sounds a little hokey, but those messages actually help reinforce the whole process that you just forced yourself through. And it makes it more more natural. Maintaining and or building lean body mass is one of the best things for metabolism, right? I sit here, if I have more lean body mass, I'm burning more calories. But it's also, you know, it's connected to so many health markers. And not to mention, um, people that have more muscle mass are able to... Uh, they have a better body fat set point meaning so one one of the issues with with weight loss is there's something called a body fat set point which has now been you know used to be a theory and now has been more confirmed so it just means that if you've stayed at a certain uh, weight for a long period of time your body's gonna have a tougher time moving from that weight right because that's what's safe that's homeostasis so if you go up or down too much but especially down it's gonna go like whoa survival <laughs> you know like this is this is not good and then the hormone leptin is almost like a thermostat, right? It's a thermostat in the sense of if you drop, it's going to basically uh, reduce the temperature so that we kind of come back, right? If we go up, so it's going to regulate it because it wants you to stay in that homeostasis. Exercise and strength training has been proven to be able to um, adjust that, or should I say like help with that. So if you drop weight and you strength train, your body will have an easier time staying at that lower weight. Right. And there's been a lot of studies done around that enough to confirm, like, first of all, like this is something you have to do right now. What does strength training look like? I mean, it it's obviously depends how much do you want to improve your performance and put on muscle. But any person that wants to be healthier, lose weight, be fitter long term should be doing some form of, of exercise and strength training like that's been proven across the board. And a lot of times people say, OK, Luca, what if you had a template? You know, and obviously everything's different for everybody. But if you had a template, I had a great conversation um, with Dr. Andy Galpin about this. But what would it be? I said, well, one, uh, you should strength train two to three days a week. Right. So somewhere in that range, you should do something fast one day a week, regardless of your age, what your goals are. And I'm going to touch on that one, because I think that's one that's 
missed out a lot on, right? Yeah. And it's, um, first of all, the first thing that you lose as you age is not strength, it's power. power it's not yeah. cardio, it's power. And people that, you know, uh, first of all, things like agility, quickness, reactivity, um, when folks fall and break their hips, which is a huge number, like one out of three people over the age of 50, uh, that's power, right? That's speed, that's reactivity. And it, it's almost like there's this fear of it, right? Oh, as I get older, I shouldn't be doing that. But it's actually like, no, you should. Now, it might look different for, you know, if I'm doing box jumps and full-blown sprints and we have somebody that's 55, maybe even 60, they may not be doing the same thing. But you know what? They could be throwing a medicine ball explosively for them. They could be uh, pushing a sled fast. They could be... Um, We'll do, you know, card throws, like I'll throw cards and obviously they, they, they get all wonky. They're going to try to catch them. Uh, tennis ball drills, speed ladder drills. For them, that's going to be fast. And they can still improve that speed and they can still, uh, I would say, work on that so that it doesn't, they don't lose it. Like you, you don't use it, you lose it, right? right. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, I mean, great examples like my, my dad is Parkinson's, the onset of it. He goes and he boxes, right? So he does these speed ladder drills. And, you know, the doctor was like, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever you're doing, man, it's like, it's keeping it at bay. And so that like speed is such an important factor of it. Mm -hmm. So once a week, at least you should be doing something fast. Once a week, you should get your heart rate up high for whatever that is for you. So think hard conditioning, right? Uh, I like to do that heart rate monitoring. So do something, you know, fast, explosive for whatever, whatever that uh, person is get the heart rate high let it drop back down i know this is basics but but this is definitely a template of it once a week do something for a longer duration of time on cardio but not as high of intensity and i would i would say probably more like once to twice a week on on that front and always making sure that you work on quality movement you know and um even in the last show we kind of dove pretty deep into that as far as movement hygiene mobility um i mean that's extremely important because my my philosophy is always move well move more move strong move fast right and but it starts with move well if you don't move well and then you add uh more volume you add more load on top of that you add speed it's going to be you're just going to speed up dysfunction right mm -hmm. so if i'm have a horrible posture and I don't first, you know, improve my mobility and, and move well, guess what's going to happen? Right? I'm going to load that and something's going to go off. My neck, my shoulder, my low back, something's going to break down. So when it comes to exercise, I, I really, really like that template because if you strength train two, two to three days a week, you do a little longer di distance or should I say longer duration cardio, which can be a lot of different things, about, you know, two days a week. You do speed training uh, once a week and you do one, maybe two sessions with higher intensity uh heart rates that's a pretty damn good model right there right and the reason i say this to this many times is because somebody that's just starting off hey two strength sessions you know uh and one speed session and one cardio session great and you can do it in, this, in the same day for example i could do speed training and then afterwards do high intensity intervals right those couple together pretty well. I can do a strength session and then afterwards do some longer duration, right? There's, there's ways to piece it together. It doesn't have to be somebody's going like, hold on. So I got to train eight days a week. <laughs> like, yeah. no, no, no. Like, but I'm saying that type of stimulus, right? That type of stimulus. We live in an age where you need to, you know, we only have so much time. So if you have an hour, I could do, you know, a quality warm up for 10 minutes, do strength training for 30, 40 minutes. And finish off with some type of you know high intensity conditioning for 15 and that's an hour and five minutes but but i've i've now knocked out a couple of those variables inside of that training session so it, i think it's important to you know just look at okay what are the things that help us be more resilient strong what, and longevity right we, we know cardio used to be a thing that we did to lose weight you know and we know that's not the most effective thing whatsoever but it is extremely important when it comes to health, extremely. And um, um, I'm, I'm glad that like one of my really close friends, Joel Jameson, has done so much research on it. He put HRV on apples, one of the first guys that did that. Like, you know, the, the correlation of like quality cardio and heart rate variability is, uh, you know, I think that you end up, um, there's certain markers that show you live 10% longer if you have, you know, quality cardio and you have 
good HRV. That's that's like eight years, seven to eight years. You know, could I sell you on that? Hey, listen, like, would you like to live ten percent longer? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, great. Make sure you do your cardio. Um, and there's, like I said, there's different ways to do it. I think that's a pretty, pretty good template to do that. I feel like so many people don't understand the effect that exercise has on mental health and on belonging and on resilience and that it's so profound. I mean, you said it's what our genes expect from us, that when we move on a regular basis, when we are active, we, it, we are able to access the parts of our human nature mm. that help us thrive and that literally produce joy and allow us to experience joy and meaning. It sensitizes your brain to pleasure. There's like nothing you can do that actually changes the structure and function of your reward system the way that exercise seems to do it and that it teaches your brain to expect things to be pleasurable and it enhances your brain's capacity to, to enjoy everything from good food and a beautiful sunset to interactions with your kids or with your friends to, to anything that we find pleasurable. It actually it, it amps up your reward system. It makes it more robust and responsive. Mm. Like endorphins work better, you know, endocannabinoids work better. Um, and like, like I said, I've, I've literally never seen anything in the research that has that effect on the brain other than deep brain stimulation where you literally have to imp, like surgically implant an electrode into your reward system and wear like a pacemaker for your brain. And that, you know, it's one of the cutting edge treatments for um, depression. And it may also help people recover from addiction because addiction can really mess with your reward system. But like other than implanting an electrode in your brain and, and literally um, giving your reward system an electric shock continuously to try to wake it up. Exercise seems to be the only thing that does this. Yeah. And think about like what that means for, for your well-being. Mm -hmm. If everything that feels good feels better. Yeah. And it, it does the opposite too, right? So everything that, so it makes your brain more um, resilient to stress. It, it's, you know, exercise is such a powerful antidepressant. So it works on both levels. And I feel like people have a better understanding of that side of it. At least they've heard you know, that exercise can be an antidepressant or that it can enhance antidepressant medication and therapy. But I feel like this idea that, that exercise actually makes you better at enjoying things is, is the thing that people really haven't heard yet. I think this is the most fascinating research. I mean, you know, so I'm interested in all psychology, all neuroscience, and this is the, I think, the most interesting finding of the last decade in all of science. And this is the insight that your muscles are basically an endocrine organ that secrete hormones into your bloodstream that affect every system of your body. And from a health point of view, um, you know, your muscles will secrete um, hormones and other proteins that are good, you know, that fight cancer cells and that are good for your heart health. You know, the things that we know, typical, why exercise is good for your health. But um, your muscles, they secrete chemicals and proteins when you exercise that are also really good for your brain health. And one of the first papers, you know, almost 10 years ago, that was published explaining that when you contract your muscles, they literally secrete these, these proteins into your bloodstream that make you resilient to stress and can protect you from depression. The scientists called them hope molecules. This idea that literally your muscles are manufacturing like antidepressant molecules. And the only way to get them into your bloodstream where they, they can then travel to your brain is you have to contract your muscles. Like that's it. But your muscles are, it's like a pharmacy in your muscles. And anything you do that contracts them, walking, hiking, running, dancing, weightlifting, like swimming, anything, you are going to be dumping hope molecules into mm. your bloodstream that when they get to your brain, they, they work as an antidepressant and they also help people recover from trauma. Like that, that's like a miracle. I mean, I, you know, because of course it's wonderful when when medications work for you, but for so many people, medications don't work or they don't do the full job in terms of helping with mental health. And the idea that your your muscles could provide you with the, the equivalent of something like an antidepressant medication, like that is just, I think it's phenomenal. One of the ways I've been able to change my state and change my emotions is how I move my body. The quickest fix for me on changing my emotions is to change my physiology is to work out, is to walk, is to make love, is to laugh. These are things that quickly change my emotions because the same physiology is required in all of them. So I know you're an expert on this as well, but this is why your show matters so much to me because it's very difficult if you're not moving your body and using it in an elegant and beautiful way to the best of your ability that you can generate the emotions on a regular basis that you want. Stagnation 
and a lack of health makes it very difficult to feel bliss and peace when you're not moving your body. So when people ask me, so what's a change agent for you emotionally? Move my body. I'll take a walk. I'll take a run. I'll do a workout. I'll do jumping jacks in my office if I have to, but I'm going to change my physiology that oftentimes changes my emotions and my state. Have you noticed in the last, we'll say last 10 years, an increase in people who are high performers in business really taking their health more seriously? Yes. And there's, this sounds funny. I actually take one millionth of 1% of credit for that. Because way back in the day, maybe like 30 years ago, I was one of the first people to say, I'm a business athlete. I consider myself an athlete. I'm training like an athlete. You look nowadays like LeBron James trains like a businessman, but he's also an athlete. Jay-Z, you know, I'm a businessman. I'm a businessman, right? Like he's a business person. I was one of the really a long time ago. It wasn't popular. I was in gyms. As an gyms were popular. But business people in gyms wasn't really, really popular. I train like I'm an athlete. I think like I'm an athlete. I want to have the longevity of an athlete in my life. Now, my training's changed. I'm a little bit more delicate with my body, so to speak. I do more stretching and more yoga than I used to. I think the way you train is also a metaphor for your life. And I'll just be candid with you. I've trained heavy, hard, and dispensed violence and justice in the gym. I was a much bigger dude when you and I first met. And I think a little bit of that is a metaphor for how I treat myself. And so to some extent, I've altered my training where I still lift and I still train, but I do things that care for myself too. I do more stretching. I'm more hydrated than I was before. I do more yoga. I'm doing things that uh, care for my body as well. And somehow, by the way I care for my body, I tend to emotionally care for myself better also. Strength training is the most effective form of exercise for pure fat loss. So when I say fat loss, by the way, I'm not talking about weight loss. Because you could lose 20 pounds, half of it can be muscle, and you end up just being a smaller, slower metabolism, same flabbiness version of yourself, right? Resistance training leads to pure fat loss, and in most cases, you get some muscle gain with that, which we could talk about. Some people are afraid of that. They think, oh, if I gain muscle, I'm going to look bulky and big. Not true. You're just much more sculpted and have a better shape to your body. Um, studies on heart health show that strength training is at least as beneficial as cardiovascular exercise for heart health. Now, of course, the best combination, again, I want to be clear, the best forms or way to work out if you have the time and you are dedicated is to combine a lot of different forms of exercise. But we're talking head to head. And we're, I'm also talking to, again, the average person that's probably only going to do a couple days a week of exercise consistently, right? Um, cognitive function. Here's where it gets really interesting. There was a study out of Sydney, Australia that looked at strength training and Alzheimer's. And it was the only, this is one of the only times we've ever seen a non-medical intervention stop, slow down and stop the progression of the beta amyloid plaques mm. um, that, that lead to, or at least contribute to the symptoms of Alzheimer's. How is that possible? Probably, and this is a really interesting point here, probably because one of the most effective ways to improve insulin sensitivity is to simply build muscle. And Alzheimer's and dementia, some researchers will even refer to as type 3 diabetes. You'll see that it's you know, there's something connected there where, and this is why when you put people on Alzheimer's on a ketogenic diet, you tend to see some improvements because there's a dysfunction there with utilizing glucose for energy. So you improve insulin sensitivity, you tend to improve uh, cognitive function. Well, you gain a little bit of muscle and you see in tremendous improvements in insulin sensitivity. There's, there's studies on uh, severely obese individuals where they don't even have them lose weight. They just have them gain a little bit of muscle. And you see these, these great improvements in blood sugar and, and in insulin. Muscle is very insulin sensitive. Um, it's also one of the ways we store uh, glycogen, which is made from carbohydrates. So you got your liver that stores glycogen, and then you got your muscle. So you get more muscle, you have more ability to store, um, becomes more sensitive to it. Insulin is a very anabolic hormone. It actually contributes to muscle growth if you do it right. So, and there's, again, there's so much more, but we now finally have studies coming out that are showing like, wait a minute. One of my favorites is the strength studies that show how a simple strength test, like a grip test, that simple test right there will predict all cause mortality better than almost any other single metric. So like you could compare it to cholesterol or blood pressure or other metrics in a grip test is more accurate in terms of all cause mortality. So strength is very important for longevity. Muscle is very protective. And thankfully now we're having the studies. And you know, I, I named the book, The Resistance Training Revolution. I think the revolution is gonna happen 
anyway. I think we're already starting to move in that direction because the data now is finally yeah. starting to confirm what those of us in fitness have seen for, for decades now. Yeah, man, thank you so much for bringing that up because we tend to put things into isolation. You mm -hmm. know, it's just, again, another way that we're taught. So we don't really think about muscles w connecting to the brain, yes. for example. But this is all happening in one sovereign unit, one sovereign human being. Yes. And I love this point because obviously insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes is beyond epidemic proportions oh, right yeah. now. We've got about 130 million Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic right now. It's insane. But we're also looking at Alzheimer's is now number six. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And it's creeping its way into the top five. And most people have no idea about this. Unless that they've been directly impacted by it with a family member, they're not even really aware of this, this epidemic. And the biggest proportion of these folks are folks who are insulin resistant and diabetic mm -hmm, already. Mm -hmm. It's like that it is the mega risk factor we're not talking about because the brain itself, there there can be an insulin resistance taking place with your neurons, right? And so being able to improve that insulin sensitivity specifically in your brain by activating your muscles and the myokines released and all of these other metabolic benefits, we're just now starting to understand because thank you for saying this, it's all happening right now. There's yeah. so many amazing studies on the stuff you've known for years coming out right now, and it's affirming what we already know. Yeah, and it's, you know, um, when it comes to brain health, besides the insulin sensitizing effects, it's also there's also a very pro-youth uh, hormone profile effect that comes from strength training. And it's a, it's a direct one. So first off, if you improve your health, generally you'll see a better hormone profile come out of it. So, you know, more optimal testosterone levels in men and in women, better estrogen progesterone ratios, Growth hormone tends to get a little better. Cortisol gets controlled a little better. Insulin sensitivity. That's just from getting healthier, right? But only one form of exercise has been shown to directly influence hormones to make them look more youthful. And that's strength training. Now, why is that? Because the process of building muscle requires a youthful profile of hormones. It's very hard to build muscle as a man with low testosterone, right? So if you send this signal to build muscle and your body's like, we need to build muscle, one of the first things it does is it starts to raise testosterone and it starts to increase androgen receptor density. Now, what does this mean for the brain? Well, look at the studies on high cortisol and brain function, low testosterone and brain function, uh, uh, estrogen and progesterone imbalances um, and brain function, right? So there's that as well. And then there's a fourth piece, which is the, uh, the proprioceptive effects of strength training. So proprioception refers to my uh, ability to, to navigate through space, knowing where my body is in space. Okay, so like an extreme example would be like a, a Olympic diver. You know, they jump off the platform and they spin and somehow they end up diving head first, right? So incredible proprioceptive ability. Well, of all the traditional forms of exercise, because strength training encourages multiplanar movements, you know, there's a, there's a million and one different strength training exercises and there's, you know, 10 different ways to do each one. It's not like running where I'm going in the same direction yeah. or cycling, which is the same motion over and over. Or is gumping it. Strength, yes, exactly. Strength training is I'm pressing up to the front. I'm going laterally. I'm rotating. I'm rowing. It requires a presence of mind. You know, when you're doing a barbell squat, you know, it's not like I'm thinking about my argument that I had earlier like I could when I'm on a treadmill. I got to think about this next <laughs> 10 reps that I'm doing. So it also trains this pro proprioceptive ability in the brain. So when it comes to strengthening the brain um, or uh, our cognitive abilities or preventing um, things like dementia and Alzheimer's, strength training is uh, head and shoulders. You know, part of the, the challenge, by the way, because we're talking about how this is all moving in this direction, we have to erase and counter uh, the myths that surround strength training and the, you know, the way that it's been viewed for so long. Like if you talk to the average person about resistance training, the, you know, images of big bodybuilders pop up and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and they don't think about this healthy person living a long time. So that's part of the challenge. And then if you talk to women, although this is far less uh, evident today than it was 20 years ago, yeah. still I get women that tell me, oh, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna get bulky. I'm not yeah. trying to look masculine, you know, as if that could happen overnight, right? Yeah. Um, but but that's still the case. So it's we're still it's still uphill. Yeah. But thankfully, I think we're starting to see some headwind. Muscles very dense, doesn't take up a lot of space. So I'm if there's someone still watching right now that says, oh, I don't want to get any bigger though. I'm trying to lose weight. 
if you lost 10 pounds of body fat and gained 10 pounds of muscle, you would lose about one fourth to one third of the size on your body because muscle takes up less space. Okay, so get that out of your head right now. Building muscle isn't getting bigger. You have to build a lot of muscle to really get bigger. You'll just feel tighter, more sculpted. So now that we've established that, okay, muscle uh, makes up in, in, mo in many men up to 40% uh, of our bodies. It's, a, it's, a, it's an organ, it's massive, and it's expensive. Expensive, it's calorically expensive, okay? For your body simply to maintain a pound of muscle, it must burn more calories than it takes to maintain a pound of body fat. And telling your body to prioritize muscle and telling your body that you need to be stronger moves your metabolism in a less efficient way. So why am I saying that? Because I'll get people that will message me and say, oh, but this study shows that one pound of muscle only burns an extra 15 calories, as if that was nothing, by the way, but only builds, you know, burns an extra 15 calories. It's way more complex than that. The human metabolism or mammalian metabolism is one of the most complex things that we've identified, probably second to the brain. You have a range of calories that your body will burn with your current lean body mass, meaning you don't have to gain more or lose muscle. There's a range. And my lifestyle can make it more efficient, burn less, or less efficient, burn more. So like losing sleep, being stressed out, my body tends to want to store calories, right? Being more relaxed, getting good sleep, feeling healthy, tends to burn more calories. Hormones could do the same thing. Optimal testosterone levels, burn more. Low testosterone levels, burn less. Same lean body mass. So simply telling my body through exercise, through proper strength training, we need strength and we need muscle. Feeding my body appropriately, meaning I'm not cutting my calories so low where I can't, where my body's like, I don't care what signal you're sending me, we're starving. So I'm giving myself enough calories. I'm getting the adequate proteins in particular and fats in particular, those are essential. I don't have any nutrient deficiencies. Feeding my body appropriately, getting good sleep, bad sleep will also push it in the other direction. When I do that, my body becomes less efficient with calories. Then you add a little bit of muscle on top of that, you know, four or five pounds of muscle, which you're just gonna feel tighter in your body. You're looking at a significant difference in your metabolic rate. Um, I mean, on average, in my experience, I get I can get women's metabolism to boost by four to 600 calories a day. I mean, I've had way more than that, but on average, four to 600 calories a day, that's like two hours of cardio. This is not talked about. No. This is not talked about because again, you know, going to a conventional university, this calories in, calories out paradigm, which is again, this is very simplistic. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at all the mechanistic things that control how your body's processing these calories. Right. You just shared an example of literally shifting somebody's metabolism to the point that they're just naturally burning more calories. Four, I guess at four to six hundred was would be my average with a with a female client. That's that's two hours of cardio. Imagine if you if you burn the calories of doing two hours of cardio every day, but you're not. Just automatic. You just burn them, right? It's on automatic. With men, yeah. it's usually, I've seen, you know, between six to eight hundred. So you can do this with yourself. You just have to send the right signals to your body. If you send the wrong signals, you go in the opposite direction. You don't want to be in a position where you lose weight and you're eating half as much as you were before. Now you're gonna maintain it, plus do all this extra activity. It's not gonna happen. It's impossible to disentangle the decline in fertility with the commensurate decline in testosterone. This is, they're totally related uh, in both men and women, actually. So fertility is, is impacted by testosterone in, in both genders. But yeah, the, a recent analysis in 102,000 people in uh, Israel, men, over the past 16 years found testosterone levels, and this is, it's important to recognize this, age and obesity independent, right? that there was a 37% decline in testosterone levels of men in their reproductive years. So men between the ages of like, of like 15 and 30. So that's a almost a 50% drop, 37%. And I think it's important for people to recognize, you know, sometimes when we speak of testosterone, there's this association with like toxic masculinity and this, we're not promoting that, we're promoting health. For men, testosterone is linked with muscle mass. If you don't have muscle mass, where's the glucose that you're having in your kombucha gonna go? Like muscle is a major glucose sponge. It's where 80% of post meal glucose is deposited in muscle. Muscle's what's going to help you get out of bed when you're older. Muscle's gonna help your heart is a muscle. So if you don't have healthy muscle, you don't have a healthy life for both men and women. And so I think this is really important um, low testosterone levels are linked with Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, in men as they go, get older, cardiovascular disease, all cause mortality. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to disentangle healthy, normal testosterone levels from health. 
And again, we're seeing this massive decline. And I think part of it, of course, is the environment. Uh, a big part of it is obesity and so forth. But there is this other sort of what factor. What is it in the literature? Because again, there's this obesity independent effect. All that being said, obese people, diabetic people, people who unfortunately suffer from chronic diseases like sleep apnea uh, and, and sleep disorder breathing have lower testosterone levels uh, than, than people who don't. But as you talked about, a simple fix that all of us should be striving for is just walking, both men and women. But this study found, I want to say it was like 400 men, or maybe it was more like 1,000 in that ballpark. The study just came out uh, in the summer of this year, found that men who walk north of 8,000 steps per day, and they controlled for all these other variables in the statistical analysis, have higher levels of testosterone compared to men who don't walk. Uh, 8,000 steps per day. And there's like a linear progressive stepwise increase. Mm -hmm. So let's say one day you only walk 4,000, but tr try to get at least 8,000 steps per day. And mechanistically, they don't know why that is. Is it because walking is linked with less belly fat, better insulin sensitivity? Who cares? But the point is that you need to walk, you know? And that being said, there was another study that just came out in 329,000 people. And they looked at all sorts of diseases and found again, walking is one of the, the best ways to prevent obesity, hypertension, sleep apnea, type one and type two diabetes. There was depression was a big one. Um, so again, people who walk between eight and 10,000 steps per day have a significantly lower chance of developing the, the most common conditions and ailments that people go to the doctor for. So it's like, how many physicians are writing a prescription? Hey, Sally, I know you have sleep apnea. I know you're depressed. I know you're obese. Here, walk 10,000 steps per day. But literally the scientific research in 320, this wasn't like 30 people, 329,000 people in this particular study and it was published in Nature. So yeah, I think, you know, my general rule is space out the walking as well. So 2,000 steps before breakfast, which is doable. Even if you have kids, bring your kid with you. Like mm -hmm. my daughter and I, we walk to school and she loves it. She's talking, dad, dad, you mm -hmm. know. Um, yeah. It's just great. You're, you're in training your body's circadian clock system, getting light into the retina, all of that. Um, and so just space it out. Do 3,000, you know, or sorry, 2,000 before breakfast. Or, you know, after lunch is a good time to walk, especially if people feel that post-meal kind of lethargy and they get tired. Part of that is a reactive hypoglycemia. Blood sugar goes up, insulin goes up, and then blood sugar goes down and you feel lethargic. And so a great way to sort of blunt that is just to take a walk. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. What if I told you these are diseases of skeletal muscle first? And that obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular disease begin in skeletal muscle first. Insulin resistance begins in skeletal muscle first. And if we care about root cause medicine, then we have to care about skeletal muscle.